Well, thank you so much, uh, Alison. And I also want to thank the worship team, Waymaker. Indeed, he's our Waymaker, and he continues to work. Uh, that's actually in line with what we're going to share today, that God has a grand plan and he's constantly working. So uh, welcome once again, and good morning to all of you and all those um, uh, also uh, watching us over online. Well, I, I will share a bit of my own story just to help us understand that work. God is indeed uh, having a great and grand plan for each and every one of us. So by now, you would recognize that I do have some uh, Singapore accent. Well, I'm actually born and bred here in Hong Kong. I studied in local universities. I worked in one of the most busy hospitals here in Hong Kong for 10 years. Until I really got stuck uh, professionally, I, I yearned for a breakthrough. And uh, we made a very difficult decision, a family of four. Uh, we actually decided to emigrate over to Singapore. And that was 27 years ago. And to be exact, it is 1st of July, 1997. Whoa. Anyway, we did uh, fairly well uh, over there as a family and as well as uh, professionally. But most significantly, was that I actually rededicate my life to Jesus. And my wife uh, first came to know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior over there. So over there, we enter into a new reality. Well, of course, it's a different location, but there's a new reality with a new identity. Now, while we settled fairly well over there um, by God's grace and divine purposes, we actually uh, got a chance to relocate back here to Hong Kong. So 10 years down the road, we moved back, and um, here we are, uh, attending divine uh, worshipping, and I uh, also got to serve in the Cantonese community, as well as in the eldership. So over the years, as I reflect, uh, God has been graceful, and He's a great plan for me. Uh, we just celebrate our 60th birthday uh, wow, I look too young. Yes, Botox works. <laughs> yeah, but I also realized that, well, the blessing actually extends to over the next generation. My daughter and my son-in-law, well, they were here in the 915 service. So they, they tied their knots uh, just a few months ago while they're also planning to move over to London to start a new season. So uh, I'm actually quite amazed that how come this wonderful young Chinese gentleman from Australia got to work here in Hong Kong and met my, well, also quite wonderful daughter. <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, God has a grand plan for each and every one of us. He, in due time, He revealed His purposes in us. And it's actually for us to give thanks to Him and even to praise Him for what He has done in our life, in the past, in the present, and that would continue into the future. Well, that's uh, what Paul wants to share with the congregation in Ephesians, that while well, indeed God is doing great and wonderful things. So let's read um, the uh, Bible text for today. That's in chapter 1. Praise be to God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every single spiritual blessing in Christ. For it chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. In love, He, pre he predestined us for adoption to son sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance to his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good will and pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into full effect when the times reach the fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in Christ, for all things in heaven and on earth to be under him. 
In him we were also chosen, predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, the first to put our hope in Christ, may be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. So you can see purposes, goodwill, plans, all come from God. Well, indeed, it is a lengthy passage that really originated from one sentence in the original Greek. I'll share with you in the next 20 minutes or so three things. One, how God or what God has done in Christ. Number two, uh, we try to find the distinction between in Christ versus Christ in us. And lastly, we talk about Christ being the head, and that should bring comfort. Let's come back to verse 1, uh, verse 10, which is the core message. The whole passage is about spiritual blessings planned by the Father, accomplished by the Son, and applied by the Holy Spirit. So indeed, it actually says, blessed is the God who bless us with every spiritual blessing, heavenly blessings. But why a doxology? Doxology actually literally means glory. Okay, why a doxology up front? Well, many of us, pre-believers and believers included, wrongly assume that the reality is the physical world around which we feel we touch or we experience. Yet the doxology asserts that the reality is much, much bigger. It includes God, His actions, and what takes place in Christ and in the heavenly realms. We must expand our thinking to do justice to this larger reality. Because in our contemporary practice, we view ourselves as the primary actor on the stage of history. But Paul's doxology reminded that God is the primary actor. Just the other day, a few of the fellow elders uh, went to visit a church member and pray for God's healing. And that is beyond what the doctors may say and mention about his physical reality and challenges. We must see the bigger reality of God's grand plan for this individual and for each and every one of us. Now, paradoxically, I actually worked in the medical line. And uh, more often than not, I actually would slip into the mode of viewing myself as the healer. I have neglected the bigger reality. The bigger reality is that I'm only there to manage or to treat certain medical conditions. Ultimately, only God heals, and that is the bigger reality. In Christ, well, let's zoom in a bit more to the prominent theme in this passage, in Christ. The expression in Christ, in the Lord, in Him, appear 164 times in Paul's writing. Paul's writing really flows from his understanding of how we are to be connected and unified with Him. So we can read from this passage, we enjoy every spiritual blessing in Christ. We are chosen in Him and adopted through Him. Redemption is accomplished in Him as the revelation of the mystery of His view, so that God's purpose is to unite all things in Him. We enjoy an inheritance in Him, and also we are sealed with the Spirit in Him. Among all the possible other meanings or translations, let us concentrate on the key understanding of in Christ in this context. It's more what we call a location, a location sense. When we think of Christ, the location, as the vast repository or treasury holding the gifts of God. 
and Christ is the source of all the spiritual blessings. And while we reside in Him, we enjoy all these blessings. But mind you, our individuality is not lost when we are fully in Christ. It is not some Eastern religious thought of absorption into the deity. Rather, Christ and we abide in the unity whereby Christ sets the parameters for life and makes available God's provision for life. What are the implications of our being in Christ? When we are in Christ, we are united with Him and participate in His death, resurrection, and life. Now, this interplay of death and life is uh, dynamic, and I would say it's mind-blogging. Let me illustrate by citing a not too uncommon scenario, chemotherapy. How it works? Now, the toxic chemotherapy would literally kill the cancer cells. And part of it, well, part of the individual who received the chemotherapy also dies in some extent. Well, that is how exactly new life begins. The normal regenerative cell would begin to repopulate and replace all that which was lost. The chemotherapy concept applies to various cancers, and many a times the chemotherapy is actually designed with what we call an intent to cure. That means we can cure a person from his disease. That purposeful death and renewal concept is particularly true for some uh, blood-borne cancer, uh, or we call it leukemia. Now I have this understanding as a personal first-hand experience. Now for all of you here, if you do your health check, your blood count, your white cell count will be somewhere like 5 to 10. That is normal. My cell count, as my leukemia progressed, went up to 100. 150. And I panicked. I thought about death. Well, I bite the bullet and go ahead with the chemotherapy. And specifically, it is what we call a targeted therapy. The day of the treatment, I was so ill, so sick, I literally thought I was going to die. In fact, my cell count dropped to the level of below one on day one post-treatment, which was dangerously low, to the extent that my oncologist has to stop all the scheduled treatment altogether so that I will be allowed time to recover for the cell to replenish. And thereafter, in a sense, I died, and I died again yeah, as I received multiple causes of the same treatment along the way. That was almost uh, seven or eight years ago. I lost count, but I'm happy to share with all of you that I am treatment-free and I'm disease-free. New life has crept into my life, even as part of me died. Just remember, his death is our death, and his life is also our life. It is in this solidarity achieved by a double identification via the incarnation and faith. What it means? In the incarnation, Christ identifies with us. And by faith, we respond and we identify with Him. To be in Christ does not mean uh, to be the, um, inside Christ as tools are in a box or clothes are in a closet, but rather we are organically united to Christ as a limb is in the body or a branch is in the tree. We are all familiar with this. Christ, I am divine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. It is this personal relationship with Christ that is the distinctive hallmark of his authentic followers. As we live in Christ, our awareness of the presence of God and of living in Christ becomes the keys to all aspects of our life. 
How strange would it be if we are to forget the place that we live? Well, we lived in different places here in Hong Kong over the 16 years we are back here. And my wife, Vivian, is superbly efficient in arranging for every time that we move house. I had the experience of actually, for a number of times, that I left home in the morning, went to work. Then I, when I left work, I go to a new place, new house altogether. I just need to be reminded, well, you are to move to a new place. Well, we need to be reminded because for in Him, we live and move and have our being. I do want to highlight some the important distinction between the notion Christ in us and we in Christ. We often find comfort and indeed we should find the comfort as we embrace that Christ is in us. His presence and His company should be reassuring. However, when we only emphasize that Christ is in us, there may be a danger that we become me-focused. We try to identify or define reality, and Christ would be about one inch tall. On the other hand, if we realize that we are in Christ or under Christ, He determines reality, and He encompasses all that we are. Indeed, some of us might struggle with too much of a focus that Christ is in us. Therefore, having that danger of Christ almost submitting to our will, our control, as if, as if Christ is only there to meet our own needs. On the other hand, if we have a distorted understanding of being in Christ, then we might think, well, we need to do nothing more than whatever He has already done. We take for granted all that He has done for us, and we live in a passive way in this world. Well, both dangers are common in the church, and perhaps you have experienced one way or the other. I know I have. Well, let me share my story to illustrate the distinction. Christ in me or me in Christ. I mentioned that I decided to move or relocate back here to Hong Kong. It was largely due to an offer to take up a leading academic position in one of the local universities. Personally, it is a major career advancement, and I really had that dream of leaving a legacy professionally to be remembered. Uh, we did not take this offer lightly. Uh, we did all the good things that a good Christian is supposed to do. We prayed, we discerned, we shared, we waited. Uh, it was quite some time before we finally took up the offer. I was confident that Christ was in me and with me. I was also committed that uh, I would bring His presence to the workplace. But my honest reflection and confession was that the focus was still me. Those few years working back in Hong Kong were most challenging. Not that I didn't anticipate all those challenges in the first place. As it turned out, probably partly due to my shortcomings, I did not secure the tenure position. I lost my job. I had to leave the prestigious position and the title. And I have to journey on in the private practice setting, starting all over again. It's painful. My dream died. But then I realized Jesus' dream for me is alive and vibrant. His dream is alive and vibrant. I come to understand I am in a bigger than myself reality. I am in Christ, for in Him we live and move and have our being. First and foremost, I would say I'm really proud that I was once part of a team and that they have since ascended to even greater heights professionally and academically. But for myself, that I'm in private practice 
allows me a lot of more time and space to ponder on, well, how I can serve him better. And that is not necessarily via my profession, nor the title that I bear. Rather, I am in Christ, and therefore He should dictate how best to entrust me in whatever arena or circumstances. So I had the inspiration from my wife, who actually finished her seminary studies in her 50s, and I thought, well, I could do likewise. So I completed my part-time seminary studies while I was in full-time medical practice. And that was despite the healthcare challenge of having to go through multiple courses of chemotherapy. Studying in the seminary teach me to humble. That there is far more that I do not know than the very little that I study and got to know. And that stirred up my yearning to know him more. On serving, I had the joy of serving the Cantonese community, which again had a humble beginning. We started as one of the earliest Cantonese-speaking small groups. That was 10 years ago. We started at home, but it soon bursted. God blessed um, the community tremendously. We moved back to the premise in this church building, and it continued to grow into a Chinese ministry. Uh, along the way, we also, the, this church saw the birth of a Mandarin speaking community. Now, the very little Mandarin that we picked up when we were attending church in Singapore became useful and handy because we were able to reach out um, to other, uh, especially those who are Mandarin speaking. So, in that sense, God prepared us or this church to reach out to others in interesting, and creative ways. Of course, I'm also proud and had the privilege to serve with a wonderful bunch of elders um, in this church in the past nine years, going through firsthand the tremendous ups and downs for this church. We went through all the trials and triumphs together including during the social movement period and the COVID restriction. But we are thankful, thankful to you, because you gave generously and faithfully through the difficult times. And we are so encouraged because you make every single effort to come and worship and to gather in this place. We can testify the great purpose of God including his seeing us through the tremendous hurdles of setting up the Yunong church plant. Now, I'm not recounting all this as Christ in me. It's not about me, but rather as an individual in this congregation. I witness the hands of God moving amongst us, all of us. And this is only a mini account of the many good things God is working in this church through the many of you seated here today to serve and love each other in your small groups, in your K4C classes, in the language ministries, in the prayer team, in Alpha, in worship team, in your outreach efforts, in your smile, when you meet someone in this congregation and in your hard work up front or behind the scenes. There are people who begin to ask me how I would like to serve as I step down from the eldership board later this year. Good question. Lots of wrestling. Well, but I believe the best is yet to be. Well, no solid answer yet. However, I would say on behalf of the, my fellow elders that they are committed to serve all of you diligently in days and years to come. But actually, each and every one of us should be asking these questions. How we can best serve our God and how God wants His best for this church 
and how he wants to entrust each and every one of us here. I do have a glimpse of the possible future for this church, that each congregant here is called into a community, intimately rooted in his word and in him, and ever ready to reach out to others. Well, after all, God's plan for us remains a mystery, but will be revealed in the fulfillment of time. Indeed, verse 10 says, it would be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Note that Paul actually expands this use of language to a cosmic scale. Everything, creation and redemption of the cosmos is to be in Christ, under Christ. The word translated as bring unity is interesting. Read, read, and uh, kafalio. Uh, kafali means the head. Okay, so we have medical conditions like microcephalus, very small brain. Uh, we have hydrocephalus, water filled up brain. But it's a, different, it's a different head we are talking about. It's the majestic royal head, Christ in the heavenlies. So it is significant because it emphasizes on three things. One, Christ is the head, the ruler. Christ sums up or brings things to a coherent and meaningful whole. And number three, Christ restores harmony to a universe that was chaotic because of sin. So what would be the implication? Now we have fellowship, not only with God, but also with one another. Vertically, Christ connects God and the church here. Horizontally, Christ connects all of us, even those who come from diverse social economic backgrounds. Christ is ruling over us. His fulfillment has begun through his life, death, and resurrection. He's already Lord of all times, just as redemption is both now, present, and future. And yet the future has moved into the present and changes how we should live. I do understand sometimes we doubt because we do not see obvious actions from him. And then we wrongly assume that God is not active. Well, God is not necessarily public in all his actions, but surely God does reveal himself in his own time. He's active in making his purposes in Christ known. So we almost need a sign that reads, slow down, God is at work. Slow down, God is at work. That should be comforting because Christ is supreme over everything in this world. This could speak to our fears for the future or worries that we hold for the present. It should help us free from the oppression or the opposition that we are facing. We have Jesus who is head over everything. Therefore, we have peace in our present. I really love the school motto of my son when he studied in Anglo-Chinese school in Singapore. The motto is, the best is yet to be. The best is yet to be. As my, son, uh, as my son-in-law and my daughter about uh, to plan to their move in UK in just two weeks' time, well, my encouragement for them is the best is yet to be. But they are to discover for themselves the bigger reality of God's grand plan in their lives. Likewise, young men, young women, and indeed everyone in this congregation, we are assured and promise that the best is yet to be. How about for this church? 
planting a church in Yunnong or growing in numbers here in Wan Chai are not by themselves the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes for the vine. There is a bigger reality, but His grand plan for this church will continue to unfold. So I uh, paraphrase the whole prayer in this biblical text by Paul. I would like to invite all of us to stand so that we may read this prayer together in a paraphrased manner. So we shall see on the screen the prayer that I wrote, how marvelous God is. And let us read together. His Spirit has provided everything needed for life and for the vine. For every good thing has been made available in Christ. We praise such a God. Right from the first, God has been busy devising a way to draw us home to Himself so that we may live with Him and for Him. Through Jesus Christ, He has made us family. As a result, the vine praised God for the way He freely gave Himself to us in Christ. In Christ's death, God's abundant care for us is known. God gave Himself for us to bring us back and make us His people. What lavish love He has for us. We honor you, God. In His unfathomable wisdom, God has made known His plan and desire to bring all things together in Christ. This includes everything in our world and everything in God's world. Amazingly, God's plan includes the vine and gives us a share of what He is doing. For this, the vine praised God for the hope that is ours in Christ. When we heard about the truth from God and believed the good news about His plan, God marked us as His own by giving us His Spirit. The Spirit dwelling in us is a pledge from God that He will complete His plan and that one day we will truly live with God. For this we, the vine, praise you, our God. We do worship you. May I invite the band? And I want to challenge all of us while I give you this encouragement. And in a short moment's time, you are most encouraged to join us in the prayer line as you commit yourself. Number one, we all have a dual identity on earth and in heavens, which is the bigger reality. You might be from local or you may be from a foreign land. Dare to believe that you are here in Hong Kong in this season as part of God's grand plan for Hong Kong. And you matter to Him. You might be born and bred from the ministry of this church. Or you have moved in from other congregation to try to settle here in the vine. Dare to believe that you are part of God's grand plan in this church. You matter to us. Last, allow His comforting presence to rest in you always, as indeed He is in you. But also be mindful that He encompasses all that we are. We are in Christ and under Christ. Let Him take lead in your life. And that, His dream becomes your dream. Be truly blessed by our blessed, worthy God.